Good morning. Ah, uh, this morning. Yes, thank you. Um, we are in the Being Challenge. We're in uh, the third week, and when we started this series, I said that um, being is the single most important target uh, that we can aim at. It's about being with Jesus, and that informs our, our lives. And so far in this series, we've looked at a, a couple of different things. We've looked at uh, committing to community because we can't do this alone. We've looked at studying scripture uh, because for us as followers of Jesus, it is the single most important influence in our lives. And this morning, we're going to talk about prioritizing prayer. I don't know about you guys, but um, communication has changed quite a bit. Like I was just thinking about the kids that went to the National Youth Gathering this past summer and how uh, we had like 40 kids going with me when I went and we'd arrange these different meetups at different times and magically all the kids showed up where they were supposed to when they were supposed to. It was like a miracle because that's not how it works anymore, right? Because the phone rings, hey, where are you? I can't find you. And that goes the same way at the Sacramento airport, right? Anybody else fly in and out of Sacramento? It's one of my favorite airports. I love that place, and I'm going to give you the secret. The secret to that airport is this. Because I called my, my friends that flew in a little while back, and, and they're down there by the baggage claim, and they text me, hey, we're here. Okay, cool. Okay, we're going to get our bags. Okay, we're down at door, door one. And I'm like, okay, what you need to do is turn around and walk to door three because there's never any traffic over there. Well, we can't find it, comes a text two minutes later. And then I say, just turn around and walk the other direction across the way, and I'll pull up and I'll be right there. Back and forth, back and forth, and finally like, okay, I'll wait through the traffic, I'll come get you. 20 texts later, that's how communication goes in our world, doesn't it? Back and forth, back and forth, and we all seem a little bit confused and a little bit distracted. We're in this crazy, distracting world. And I think that all of the noise in our lives keeps us from being able to pay attention so that we can be in the right place at the right time. You know, I also find encouragement in this as we jump into this topic. In Luke uh, chapter 11, Jesus goes off to pray. Uh, when he finished one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Here, here are Jesus' disciples, men who had been walking with Jesus for a year, perhaps more at this time. And they're saying, Lord, we don't really know how to pray. Can you help us? And it also tells me something else, that there was something about the way that Jesus prayed. Something about the way that he prayed that the disciples said, that's not how we pray. I want that. I want my prayers to sound like that, to feel like that. I want to feel like I am connected. I want to feel the passion. I want it to be this dry routine thing that sometimes we hear on the Sabbath day, which was Saturday, in the synagogue. I want something different. I want to do what you're doing. And then sometimes I think prayer can feel cold and apathetic. Guy wrote this, sometimes I feel I'm becoming cold and apathetic about prayer. This is usually because of all the things that are distracting me and filling my mind. We have to be absolutely certain that we do not allow ourselves to be distracted from genuine prayer. The devil is not lazy. He will never stop attacking us. It's actually a guy by the name of Martin Luther who lived in the 1500s. And he's complaining about being distracted. How much more do we have to deal with today? We have an enemy who wants to distract us, who wants to keep us from being engaged in prayer and connecting to our Father. You know, prayer is one of those things that a few years ago I discovered that, you know, I really wanted to work on in my life. And so I got this book, uh, The Songs of Jesus, it's been one of my favorite um, books. Can you throw that up there? Uh, and just something else to, to encourage you. The, the, the Psalms were the prayer book uh, of the Hebrew people. And so this author goes through it. And it's been my daily devotion thing that I read every morning. And I feel like it's helped me in prayer as something maybe for a tool that you might want to look into. 
What do we do when we don't feel like praying? What do we do when we're not certain what to do when it comes to prayer? And the reality is, is that if we want our prayer life to look different, we should look to the habits of Jesus. The habits of Jesus can inform our prayers. And so what are the things that we see Jesus doing? The first thing we see is that Jesus prayed early and often. Over 50 times in the, the New Testament, in those first four books, the Gospels, we see the disciples the ones that wrote the Gospels, taking note of Jesus going to pray. And this is a pattern for him. He's often praying early and often. In Mark 1.35, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And then also in Luke chapter 5, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus went away to places where he wasn't going to be distracted by the noise. He wasn't going to be distracted by everything going on so that he could make prayer a priority in his life. There's a guy by the name of Greg McEwen who wrote this about priorities. He explains the surprising history of the word priority and its meaning, how its meaning has shifted over time says the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. It was singular. It meant the very first or prior thing. It stayed singular until the 1900s when we pluralized, that's a weird word, the term, and started talking about priorities. Illogically, we reasoned that by changing the word, we could bend reality. Somehow, we would now be able to have multiple First things. I don't think that's how counting works. People and companies routinely try to do just that. They talk about priority one and priority two and priority three and so on. This gives the impression of many things being the priority, but actually means that nothing is. I don't know if you've ever been told that, but someone once told me, if you want to be everything... You can't be anything. What is going to be the priority in your life? You know, I was in the military, and seemingly we thought that pray first was a good motto. And so in the military, I was the guide on, meaning that I got to represent the company. And so here's a picture of me from about 2007 in uniform with the guide on, which... I actually injured myself, and somebody had to carry all my stuff for a while. That was kind of funny. And um, on there, all those little banners or streamers up there are the mottos from all the classes that have gone through. Ours up there as well, pray first. And we had to be in formation at chaplain school before anybody else was out there. And so our call time or um, formation time was 4 a.m. And in the military, if you're not there 15 minutes early, you're late. And so we were in formation at 345, and as the guide on, my job was to stand in the back of the formation until they called us to attention, and then I would run to the front of the formation and throw the pointy stick in the ground. But what that gave me the opportunity to see, as I stood there at 345 in the morning, I know I was up about 330, and then making the mad dash down there so I wasn't late and would have to do push-ups, or even worse, was late and then everybody else did push-ups as I watched, which is really terrible. Nobody was praying. So even though we said pray first, and there's not that whole lot of time at 3.30 in the morning before getting ready and getting down there. I don't think anybody was praying then because they were trying to get out the door and down to formation. There we were standing in formation. It says pray first on our little streamer. And nobody was praying. Is prayer a priority for you, or is it a last resort? Recently, uh, we got a call from Hilton Grand Vacations, not Hilton Grand Vacations, and I got suckered into getting a vacation package. We never signed anything. We immediately tried to cancel, but they had our credit card. They forged my wife's signature, and we tried and we tried and we tried 
mountains of emails, mountains of phone calls that went unanswered. We were at about our, our wits end because we realized we weren't getting this vacation and we probably weren't going to get our money back. And finally, my wife, being the smart one that she is, says, we should pray about this. And we called one more time. And somehow, we magically landed with the right person who had seen all of the stuff that we'd sent to the credit card company, all of the stuff that we'd sent to this um, my Beach Vacations International, which was their real name. So don't do business with them, or I wouldn't anyways. And he had mercy on us. He said, I've seen what you've been through. It'll show up on your statement in a couple of days. And it said something like um, client appreciation. And it was all taken care of. And we spent all this time fretting and struggling and fighting. And finally, as the last resort, we prayed. And somehow, in the middle of that circumstance, God answered the prayer. And that was an insignificant thing. That was a, a fee on a credit card, which, okay, yeah, it wasn't a little amount, but it was a fee on a credit card. How many more important things are there in our lives that need our prayers that we wait until we've tried everything else first. Jesus also prayed because he needed help. I, I know it sounds kind of silly. It seems kind of crazy, right? Why would he pray because he needs help? He's the, the son of God. He, he knows the Father. He was there at the creation of the world, and yet Jesus prays because he needs help. We see that example most poignantly in the garden. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground, and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Elsewhere in, in the Gospels in Luke, we find that an angel came and strengthened him and encouraged him, and he prayed more to his father, seeking help for the hour that he was facing. Prayer is us as people admitting, God, I need you. It's us saying to ourselves, there is a God and I am not him. Because most of our lives we operate as if we are God, as if we are in control. And prayer is us getting on our knees and saying, God, I need you. I need your help. You are God and you are not. It's, it's recognizing our position and recognizing him in his position as the God on the throne who is able and capable and can answer prayer and wants to answer prayer for his people. I think all too often we forget that. We forget that we have a God who loves us and who wants to draw near to us and answer our prayers. In Psalm 50, the prayer book, of the Israel people, we find these ver verses, from verse seven, it says, listen my people and I will speak. I will testify against you, Israel. I am God, your God. I bring no charges against you concerning your sacrifices or concerning burnt offerings which are ever before me. I have no need of a bull from your stall or goats from your pens. For every animal of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills. Sacrifice thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. And call on me in the day of trouble. And I will deliver you. And you will honor me. It's kind of interesting there. It's kind of confusing a little bit. Because you've got two instances of sacrifices. And on one hand he's saying I don't want these sacrifices. And then he says offer thank offerings. 
and calling me down the trouble, and that's good. So what's going on here between these two sets of sacrifices? One set of sacrifices was being offered in, in tradition and ritual and as a way of earning God's favor and saying, God, please listen to us. And God's saying, your hearts are not in the right position. What I want you to do is come before me and offer sacrifices in recognition that I am God, that I do want to listen, that I do care. Come to me in need, and I will hear your prayers and answer. Come with a different position in your heart. Now, Paul says the same thing in Philippians. Pray with thanksgiving. What's Paul getting at? What was the psalmist getting at? He's getting at the idea that, that we have a God, a, a creator who rules over the entire universe and knows better than you what is good for you. And so when you come to him, come with thanksgiving, knowing that he is going to answer in a way that is best for you. The next thing that Jesus went to prayer for was because he needed direction. Quite pointedly in scripture and the gospel of John, Jesus says, I don't do anything that I don't see my father doing. As we think about that, I've got a rather poignant and challenging question. Are you following the directions of this world? Are you living in the path and saying the things that the world says are important are important? Are you looking to this world for directions and guidance in the way that you should go? I've got something scary to share with you. If you're going in the way of this world, there's some pretty scary statistics out there about what's going on right now. The average American hasn't made a new friend in the last five years. That is according to Evite. 61% of Americans are lonely, and that was pre-pandemic, according to Cigna, our health care provider. 73% of Americans are in serious debt, and that's not including the house, according to Northwestern Mutual. 78% of people are living paycheck to paycheck, and I don't know where that one's from. I can't remember that. 70% of people working are unhappy and don't care about what they do. Now the scary thing about that, I was listening to some other research on that, and, and the real challenge with that is when parents come home and they aren't happy about their work, that gets expressed onto the lives of their children, and those are the kids that then go to school and become bullies. And that's leading to all kinds of bad stuff in our society. On top of that, about half of all marriages end in divorce in our country, the sixth worst in the world. If you follow the pattern of the world, maybe not such a good idea. You might just be valuing and putting importance on the wrong things in life, and if you do that, it might lead to disaster. You might say, I'm fine, I don't need direction, I got this. Are you sure? Doesn't seem to be working out so well. It's almost like uh, what Lois Lane said in the return of Superman. The world doesn't need a savior and neither do I. I'm fine. Really? We have a God who wants to offer direction and guidance in our lives for our blessing, for our encouragement. See, Jesus did it differently. Every time when it came to a major decision in his life, when it came to any decision in his life, Jesus sought his Father first in prayer. When he's choosing the disciples in Luke chapter 6, he goes out on a day and then spends an entire night on a mountainside praying. And when a morning came, he called his disciples to him and told us 12 of them and designated them to be apostles. And then James Jesus' brother has this to say, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, 
and it will be given to you. In other words, if you're like me and you've done a bunch of stupid stuff, you can do it differently, right? Say, when you don't get it right, you can still come to God and ask for wisdom and ask for guidance because you don't have to go the way you've always gone. God is willing to step into our lives and give us wisdom, lead us down a path that leads to life and not destruction. The prayer brings direction in a confusing world. Prayer can guide us in the way that we should go. And finally, the one that is perhaps the most exciting to me, the one that's most encouraging to me, is that prayer changes the world. Prayer changes things. Our God is not a God who who wound up the world and sits on his throne, distant and far off, and says, come find me. Rather, he is a God who is engaged with our world, who speaks to us as his people and says, search me that you may find me. Ask and I will answer We have a God who wants to draw near to us and engage with us and respond to the things that are happening in our lives and the needs of our hearts. You know, the question that is most often asked when it comes to prayer changing the world is, well, what do you mean? Does prayer change me? Or does it actually change something out in the world? We talked about this back in our series, uh, Elephant in the Room. The answer is yes. Yes, prayer changes you because as you come before God in prayer, you grow in your faith and trust in him and you're, you're filled with the peace, a uh, peace that can be beyond understanding. I remember a time, my wife said I can't tell that story anymore, where, where I got left somewhere and had to get to the airport, which was a long ways away, and people gave me rides like four different times to get to where I needed to go. And everybody else around me was freaking out for me, but I was fine. Somehow I knew God had it. Give us joy. This is unspeakable, even in difficult stuff. It can give us confidence when the world is full of chaos. Our prayers matter. But we also have a God who answers prayer in more significant ways than credit card. There once was a guy that challenged a pastor and said, I don't think prayer makes a difference. He was a a medical supplier for a giant company. And the guy says, would you pray about something? And the guy says, well, I'm going to pray for Africa. The guy says, okay, come on, be a little more specific than that. So he starts praying for Kenya. Well, as time goes on, all of a sudden, this guy who is a a medical device distributor gets connected to somebody in Kenya, and there's all this medical equipment that's expiring that's not going to be good anymore, and yet there's this huge need in Kenya for the stuff that they're just going to throw away. And God answers prayer. And hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical equipment go and fill a real need in the world. God answers prayer and changes the world through prayer. He hears the prayers of his people and he responds. You know, we talk about wanting to inspire hope. uh, Wanting to show the world a a different world, a different uh, way to live and and inspire them with the hope of, of the world the way it should be, the way that Jesus designed it. And we talk about wanting to work for that. That's why we partner with Feed My Starving Children and Acres of Hope and Everyone Matters Ministry because we want to see the world the way it's supposed to be and not the way it is. But do we think about prayer and the power it has to change the world? We have a God who can do more with a single word than we can do in a lifetime. Do you believe that? You know, Lindsay was doing homework with Elise the other day, and uh, she was going through her homework, and uh, it was part of the the religious thing and and some other stuff, but uh, the question was, Caleb is taking piano lessons. He has to practice for 20 minutes each day. Caleb cannot always find the right notes. He wants to play the piano well. What should Caleb do? And this is Elise, our six-year-old, answers, well, he should pray that God would give him courage 
that he can play the piano better. Next question was, Miko doesn't like to eat vegetables, but her mom says they'll make her grow strong. Miko wants to please her mom. What should Miko do? Elise answers again. Miko should pray that the vegetables would taste good so that she would like to eat them. (laughs) Ivan finds it hard to read and write. Homework is difficult for him, but he wants to do well in school. What should Ivan do? Ivan should pray that God would make school easier for him. Elise knows that prayer is the right answer. And I think you do too. We know that prayer is the right answer. No matter what the challenge, no matter what the question. Because we have a God who listens to us, who cares about us, who wants to intervene and answer the world so that that our hearts may be changed internally and that the world may be changed externally as God's kingdom comes in our midst. We know that's the answer. Will you pray? Will you make it a priority in your life? First thing in the morning, instead of picking up your phone, well, maybe set the alarm on something else so you don't have to pick up your phone. First thing in the morning, will you pray? Before your hit, hit floor, foot hits the carpet or the hardwood floor, What if you pray and say, God, will you guide me today? God, will you guide my steps today? Will you have, help me have my heart set on what your heart is set on so that today I might walk in the path that you would lay out for me so that your kingdom, so that that what you would want to happen in my life would happen this day, that I might be a blessing to others to the glory of your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, recognizing your power, recognizing your heart, recognizing that you desire to hear us. You desire us to come to you in need. You long to answer, long to help. Help us recognize that that we might recognize that our lives are in your hands and gracefully rest there, trusting in you. In the name of Jesus, amen.